All right. So we are back. This is now lecture three for CS 164. Um, so as you know, this is a new course. So some bumps in the road were inevitable. But rather than wait till some future offering of this course, what I'd like to do, per my note last night, is fix any such uh, deficiencies now. So you saw in my email a whole variety of additional support structure that we're going to put in place. But let me just give you the context and elaborate with a bit more precision. So. Um, we took a look at the demographics of the class, and suffice it to say that even whereas in CS50 we have a range of demographics, those we call less comfortable, those we call more comfortable, that's even more of a gap in a course like this where we have a lot of students, about a third, who took CS50 this past fall, and that is their only prior Harvard uh, CS experience, two, of course, seniors who've been at the likes of Google and Facebook for internships. So there's definitely that gap, but it was not the course's intention to um, uh, put any of those at a disadvantage. Um, certainly we want to ensure that this course is rigorous and actually does provide you with sufficient real world experience with which to tackle some industry jobs, but also we don't want those students who only have taken 50 to flail. So just to give you a sense of who your classmates are, when we asked for the partnership form a while back when you took CS50, so again about a third of the folks in the class just took 50 this past fall, and then you can see from the various fall 2010, 9, 8, and never took CS50 who your classmates are. So I put this up mostly to assure that 34% that there's a whole bunch of you here and a lot of the support uh, changes that we've made are meant to ensure that you all can succeed even as we maintain the rigor of the course for those with that additional experience. So what's, um, what has changed? So one, we'll introduce sections. Um, one lecture a week, albeit two hours, isn't necessarily enough to wrap your mind around certain topics and so Tommy will start leading on Wednesday afternoons at 4 p.m. in Pierce 301, a weekly section. If that time doesn't work, that's fine um, because it will be filmed and played based online as are the lectures. So labs have proved to be fairly low energy and passive where we just kind of stand around waiting for questions and you just kind of sit around checking email um, or, you know, in fairness, working on working to some extent on the labs, but really this past week focusing on the project. Understandably so, but I think we've questioned their value in their original form. So what we decided to do is reboot labs altogether, and what we will do on a cyclical basis is redesign them as code reviews, design reviews, and uh, office hours. So we will see in a moment what that means for the schedule. And the only material change for those of you, especially with additional experience, lest you have responded to my email from last night saying that the course itself is changing. Really, the only material change is that the expectations for that initial submission, instead of it being a beta, which by definition in industry usually means all the features are there, even if it's just buggy, what we did decide to do is call this an alpha, which is more than just the semantics of it, but rather to say you absolutely have to have something at that point. So you've met a milestone, but the motivation there is so that we, the staff, can then weigh in during code reviews that week and get a sense of whether or not you're actually on a good path. But the expectations ultimately for the projects will remain the same, but the release cycle should make them more manageable. So it was my fault that Project Zero's time frame between design doc and beta was so terribly short, and I recognized the angst that that caused. It was not intentional. So what we did was rethink the re entire semester schedule, both for Project Zero onward, um, and what you'll find now is that there's at least a weekend preceding any of the non-trivial milestones. The idea there is that, especially as you're working with a partner, this will just give you more wiggle room to actually self-schedule when you guys are going to tackle things. And then no Notice we also push the release dates a couple days out toward week's end so that you don't just have a week, but rather a week and a bit to actually take things from alpha to completion. And notice too how things line up on Tuesdays. So whereas labs used to again be these hands-on activities, the idea now is that when you've submitted your design doc and style guide by noon on a Tuesday, that Tuesday night and Wednesday night and Thursday night will be an opportunity with the TFs to actually look at um, your design doc, make improvements, look at the design docs of classmates around you perhaps and weigh in with advice. Similarly with the alphas now being on Tuesday afternoons at noon, so will Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights and Thursday nights be an opportunity then both with the staff and with classmates to look at your code, where you're at, so that you can make improvements earlier rather than later. Um, I realized too that because originally we had decided to do some online based peer code reviews as well as have you wait for feedback from the staff, we the staff were also in inserting these artificial delays into the release cycle such that it might be three days before you actually get feedback and yet the next deadline is looming some three, four days later. So with this approach, I think we can maximize um, the period of time between milestones so that you can continue working or at least accommodate your schedules a little more effectively. So do continue to speak up if things prove rough, but let me emphasize though, 
the workload of the course, particularly for those with、uh, additional experience, is intended to stay the same. So here's where I need to couple some sympathy with some tough love.、Um, so 50 was a lot of work. But for a first course in computer science,、um, it was typically estimated at 10, 12. Though in fairness, 20, 25 hours a week, depending on the person in the course.、Um, but this is core. This course is indeed one where the projects are meant to take some 30 plus hours.、Um, this is、uh, actually not even a record among CS courses at Harvard. But do realize that this is a three-digit. Uh, computer science course, and so even though expectations are high, these structural changes are meant to ensure that you have the support structure in place with which to actually tackle this course successfully. But ultimately, if you were stressing over the fact that this、uh, you spent 20 hours last week on the course, like that's kind of the right ballpark for a course like this. So do keep that in mind, and do realize now that there's a more adequate, we hope, support structure in place with which to tackle those things. So project one. So the reality is here, even with these structural Changes. The reality is, you were going to see this peak and then this trough. Whereby, for Project One, it's entirely within your discretion to propose the project that you want to do, and you can stay within your newfound or brimming comfort zone. Whereby, you can use CodeIgniter for this, you can use some jQuery Mobile for this, and you can stay within the realm of the technologies that you've been struggling with or spending a、uh, ridiculous amount of time with of late, so as to make something that we don't tell you to make, but that you have、uh, chosen to make. So realize there's that opportunity. Also with Project. One though, you'll be able to go off on your own. If you've absolutely hated Code Igniter, that's perfectly fine. You can go off and use some other framework. You can roll your own, and so you'll see in the spec, which we'll post in a day or so. Exactly how much discretion you have, and it will boil down to a whole lot, both as to what you make and how you make it. So realize you're going to have a lot more control now with this next cycle. And even given that the time frame is now such that the release for Project One isn't due until March 23rd, there's a good amount of breathing room there. It's still going to be a lot of work, but at least now you can plan the next month to tackle something of interest to you. So any questions on logistics, structure, or otherwise? Okay, so even if you and your partner do still have concerns or are wondering if this is sort of something you can manage, do strike up a chat with me or Tommy or Rob、uh, during break or right after. So project one. So we'll put more details in the spec, but we've been collecting ideas、um, from folks on campus, staff and students alike,、um, and there's a dozen or more ideas there. So if you're sort of flailing about having no idea what you would want to make in terms of a web-based mobile app, at least check that out because you can at least make someone else on campus happy by solving some problem they have. So you'll see some departmental type projects there, student groups and And then some random ones as well. And just to give you a sense of where we're going in lecture, so today we'll look at design patterns, albeit in the context of PHP, and we'll define what that means in just a bit. But realize we dive into iOS and Objective C quite soon. Indeed, next week we will introduce a language called Objective C,、uh, which is essentially an object-oriented superset of the language we already know as C.、Um, and we'll transition from there to looking at、uh, the iOS SDK, Software Development Kit, and the frameworks that Apple provides, and underneath them exactly. What design paradigms they adhere to that are representative of not just Apple and、uh, iOS development, but really software development more generally.、Um, as we proceed then through the semester, we'll introduce some best practices、uh, unit tests, for instance, in the context of Objective C and Xcode. But those same ideas can be retroactively applied to things like PHP and even、uh, web programming with、uh, front-end user interface testing. And we'll talk toward terms end about scalability. So if you do have this next greatest idea, it's probably one not going to be sufficient to run it off your laptop. And it's not going to be sufficient to run it off a single server like cloud.cs50.net. You need to start thinking ultimately about how you can spread some new and amazing product that you have across multiple servers, across multiple databases, across multiple geographies. And so we'll look at some of those issues so that when you sit down to design your project, even if you only have one user yourself initially, at least you don't have to revamp it three to twelve months later just because you didn't anticipate having to deal with issues of load and scale. I mean, case in point, even Harvard courses,、um, the CS. CS50 shopping tool. If you've used it, we get about 3,500 users now per semester, and it's very slow at certain times of the day. Right, the night right before classes begin, it actually does slow to a crawl, and that's frankly because I didn't really anticipate initially that 3,500 people would actually care to use this. Right, shuttle boys used by a few hundred people, and so we too have to go back in over the course of the summer, retool that so that we're not going to anticipate thousands or tens of thousands of users certainly, but it kind of be nice if you can use it the night before classes actually begin. So we'll learn from our own lessons. There and then also security. We talk a little bit about these issues in 50, but there's so many other ways in which people can exploit your code or you can make mistakes that make your code and data vulnerable. So we'll look at those as well.
And now, um, at the risk of harming um, attendance irre uh, irre uh, irreparably, um, we finally introduced on the course's website um, the ability to speed me up. So if you go to um, cs164.tv, you'll recall that this was our first lecture here. Let me turn the music off. All right, so... So this was me at normal voice. Small room for me to start shouting. This is something. So welcome to Science 164. This is meant to be a continuation from Genesis. Because you can join the test hall four years prior. Indeed. Let's just get to the part with Rob. All right. So you can now take CS 164 50% faster. Um, so we'll we'll maybe see you next week. The reality is, though, now I just have an incentive to talk even faster, so this feature is completely useless if you try to use it online. <laughs> um, so um, without further ado, and you can also slow certain folks, myself included, down. Um, so today is ultimately about design patterns. So we're not going to look at CodeIgniter per se, and we'll find, in fact, retroactively, that CodeIgniter does offer one or more of these things called design patterns, which are not really sort of new technologies or fundamental um, sort of models that you must adhere to, but rather they're ways of approaching common problems. The reality is if you've been programming for some time, whether it's months or years, you probably find yourself, when you sit down to do a new project, stealing code or at least stealing ideas from some previous project um, and realizing that, wow, I've made something that's quite like this before. The aesthetics might be completely different. The data set might be completely different. But honestly, odds are if you did a web-based final project in CS50, there's a non-trivial number of you who essentially took PSET 7, CS50 finances code, copy the whole directory, and then just started ripping out what you didn't want and putting in what you did want so that you at least had a starting point. But even there, as we've seen, it's not the PSET 7 was not the best structured design because there was so much view, there was so much controller sort of commingled in there. And it would be very hard to, for instance, all of a sudden make CS50 Finance support, say, a mobile phone without redoing absolutely everything. So among the ideas we'll look at today through some concrete examples are how, when you have some coding problem to solve, how can you sort of approach your code in such a way that it just makes it easier to maintain and you don't, can actually ultimately write even less code. So here are just a few popular ones. Um, and if you look back at the course's syllabus, there's a recommended book called Design <laughs> Patterns by the so-called Gang of Four, a very um, famous book from a few years back that introduced and really popularized a lot of these design patterns. So even though we'll use PHP today, the reality is that most of these ideas transcend the specific language. And we'll see some of these same ideas in Objective-C. You could apply them to JavaScript. You can apply them to C, C++, um, depending on the model in question. But you'll find that a number of these are actually object-oriented in nature, which is a topic we'll look at in some detail today, but then also next week when we begin to look at iOS and Objective-C. So MVC is actually a design pattern, right? We already crossed one of these off the list. And even though you might be struggling with the actual incarnation of it in CodeIgniter, if you think back or look back at some of the homegrown examples we did a week and two ago, where I had the MVC1 directory, MVC2, MVC3, we did like nine examples of MVC, but homegrown, completely manufactured myself. And I had the header function and the footer function, or the more generalized render function. And so when we say design patterns, we mean modeling your code in this sort of generic way so that you can solve a new problem, but in the same way you solved some previous problems. So MVC is a perfect example of that that just makes it easier, arguably, to solve common types of problems. And by problem here, I mean a mobile website right? that's got multiple pages and that pulls data from a database. So singleton pattern. This is actually a very popular one, and we'll look at it in some detail today. And we've actually been using it. What does it mean if you're using this so-called singleton pattern? Anyone know? Yeah. It's a class that you only have one instance of. Yeah, so it's a class that you just have one instance of. So again, we'll talk more about object-oriented programming if you haven't quite wrapped your mind around it. But in object-oriented programming, you generally have these things called classes, though that's not necessarily the case. JavaScript, for instance, is what's called a prototype-based language. But a class is kind of like a template, not to be confused with MVC. It's like the blueprints for some data structure that's going to have zero or more pieces of data inside of it and zero or more methods, aka functions, inside of it. And so with that definition of a class, what then is an object before we come back to singleton? Yeah. Perfect. It's an instance of the class. So if you think of a class, again, as sort of a, a, 
a template or a blueprint or, or a mold, if you will. The object is the thing that comes out of the mold. And you can make as many of these objects as you want by just refilling the mold and taking the output out. So a class is, again, sort of the mold out of which you can make objects. And it's actually quite useful to have multiple instances of the